everyone. I think we're going to get started now. Uh, my name is Melissa, and I'm here, I work here at the Exploratorium. Thanks so much for coming out. How many of you have been to an After Dark before? OK. I, wonderful to see so many new faces. Every Thursday night at the Exploratorium, it's exclusively for adults from 6 to 10. And we have different programs on each of those Thursday nights, so check it out. Um, tonight's guest, Dr. Anna Frankoviak, is going to tell us about one of the smallest objects in the universe that is also, there are countless numbers of, but have this strange, they're so small that they're very hard to detect. And she's going to talk about the instrument that is used to see them. And that same instrument is also used to uh, study one of the most violent and also very common uh, events in the universe. Dr. Kramp Frankoviak did her work at this instrument, the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory in the South Pole. And the, I, and the observatory is deep down in the darkness of the ice. And so we thought that it was appropriate for nocturnal because it's deep in the ice and because the South Pole is in darkness for much of half the year. So that was our excuse. I just want to mention to you that Dr. Kraft Brankoviak is at Stanford Linear Accelerator down on the peninsula. And she's working on something really interesting now. She doesn't do neutrino physics now. Now she's working on something called Fermi bubbles, which are I guess blown out of the center of our Milky Way galaxy. And uh, if you look at the uh, models, they kind of look like a giant barbell coming out of the galaxy. But with that, I'll just uh, ask you to help me welcome Dr. Anna Frankoviak. Hello, everyone. My name is Anna Frankoviak, and um, I'm now a postdoc at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory, the national lab associated with Stanford, just a little south of here. But today I will tell you about the search for ghost particles at the South Pole. And those ghost particles are so-called neutrinos, the smallest and most elusive um, elementary particles we know of. And I actually did my PhD in neutrino astronomy, and I got excited about neutrinos because of their elusive nature. Um, and by, by the fact that people were building this giant detector at the South Pole. And I also really wanted to go to the South Pole. Um, so it's hard for me to hide my German accent, and I hope you can understand me anyways. And whoo. I get my slides back? <laughs> OK, so you can tell that I have a German accent. And um, I hope you understand me anyways. Uh, and you can actually be happy that this talk is in English and not in German, because otherwise, a simple word like science would become Naturwissenschaften. And the talk would probably take three times longer. Um, so to set the base for everyone, um, I want to tell you about the basic properties of those neutrino particles. So I already told you that they are subatomic particles, so similar um, than the electron, for example, that you've probably heard of. But different from the electron, the neutrinos have no charge. So that means they, they're not pulled or pushed away by other particles that have a charge. And they also have almost no mass. So if you compare the mass of the neutrino with the mass of the electron, it's um, similar to comparing a drop of water to a whole bathtub full of water. And in this picture, the mass of the proton or the neutron, those particles that make up the nucleus uh, of an atom, they would fill a whole bathtub, uh, a whole swimming pool full of water. So that tells you that the neutrino is really, really, really tiny. Uh, and taking all these um, properties together, uh, makes the probability that the neutrino would actually hit a nucleus when, it, when it's traveling through matter, makes it really, really, really tiny. Um, for example, if you would pass a neutrino through a wall of lead, this wall of lead uh, had to be one light year 
thick to absorb this neutrino. So on average, the neutrino can travel through one light year of lead before it would hit a nucleus. And a light year is the distance that light travels within one year. And for comparison, from here to the sun, it only takes eight minutes for light. So it's really, really far away. Um, and also Douglas Adams got fascinated by this elusive nature of the neutrinos. And he wrote in his book, Hitchhi Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the chances of a neutrino actually hitting some, something as it travels through all this holing emptiness are roughly comparable to that of dropping a ball bearing at random from a cruising 747 and hitting, say, an egg sandwich. And actually, I made this picture of, of the egg sandwich because I used a very similar picture in my, in my thesis. And three years after it was published, I got into trouble for a copyright violation. And then I had to replace it <laughs> with my own picture. Anyway, if you, if you ever need um, of an egg sandwich picture, you can find this one on Wikipedia for free. <laughs> so if the neutrino is so tiny and it can just pass through everything, why do we know that it actually, actually does exist? So the first evidence of the neutrino appeared um, in the uh, 1920s when physicists started to uh, explore radioactivity. And I show you here an example of the so-called beta decay, and that's just one form of radioactive decay where one atom decays to a lighter atom and an electron flies away. And this difference in mass is actually released in energy following Einstein's equation E equals mc squared. And the most fundamental law in physics is the conservation of energy. And to show this, I put this imaginary energy scale there. So it means the energy here has to be the same as the energy on the other side. And people had a closer look at this beta decay and they actually found that it seemed to be violated in this case um, because there was some energy missing on this side. And it was a huge problem because this conservation of energy is really, really fundamental and people didn't really want to give up on it. Um, and 20 years later, Wolfgang Pauli, a German physicist, had, um, had an idea to solve this problem. And he actually postulated that a third particle would participate in this decay. And that, that's the neutrino. It's basically invisible, but would carry away some of the energy, fixing this problem of energy conservation. It seems like a very nice solution, but actually not even Pauli himself was happy with it. And he's, he wrote to a friend in a letter, I have done a terrible thing. I have postulated a particle that cannot be detected. Because he was worried that his theory of the existence of the neutrino could actually never be confirmed, because he thought this particle could not be detected. And if you look at him, he looks actually pretty sad. And I'm not sure if this is because of the neutrino or the fact that um, his wife left him after one year of marriage, and she actually ran away with only a mediocre chemist, and he was really upset about this. <laughs> In the end, though, um, Pauli got remarried, and um, they lived together uh, happily ever after. And also, he was wrong about the neutrino, because in the end, it actually was detected. Um, so today, we know that neutrinos are produced in all kinds of nuclear reactions. So I already talked about the radioactive decay. And we can uh, find neutrinos in nuclear explosions. They are produced in nuclear power plants and in the fusion processes inside the sun. And the first detection of a neutrino actually took place um, close to a nuclear power plant. And this is a picture of the first neutrino detector with the size of 300 liters or 80 gallons. And the detection took place in 1956. And the sun is actually one of the brightest neutrino sources. And it produces so many neutrinos that every second, trillions of neutrinos pass through your body, unnoticed, though. Uh, and only one of them might hit a nucleus in your, in your body in your whole lifetime. So that tells you that they're really, really hard to detect. But actually, um, people manage to see neutrinos from the sun in a huge detector in Japan called Super Kamiokande. And it's a huge tank holding 50 million liters or 30 million gallons of water. So it means to increase the odds of, um, of a neutrino interacting, you need a really, really huge detector. Otherwise, you have to wait for many, many, many years. Um, so the fact that we have seen neutrinos from the sun actually tells you that you could use neutrinos to do astronomy with them. Um, 
And imagine you could see neutrinos from, from distant stars, not only from an, our sun, but from distant stars and distant galaxies. You could actually do really awesome things with neutrinos. Um, and one of them is solving one of the biggest mysteries in astrophysics, actually. And this is the uh, origin of so-called cosmic rays. So cosmic rays are not neutrinos. Those are charged particles, protons, so the same ones that are in the nucleus of every atom. And they're bombarding the atmosphere from all directions constantly. And they have really, really high energy. But the problem is we have no idea where they come from. Um, the problem is we can measure them on Earth, but they're probably produced in some source, some distant source in the universe. But on their way to us, they get deflected by magnetic fields because those are charged particles. And magnetic fields are everywhere. The Earth has a magnetic field, the Sun has a magnetic field, our galaxy has a magnetic field. So the direction that we measure when the cosmic ray hits the Earth doesn't tell us anything about its origin. And now the neutrino comes into, into the game because we know that in the sources, in the same processes where those cosmic rays are produced, also neutrinos will be produced. The same is also true for photons, so uh, light, basically. Um, but the problem here is that photons are produced in all kinds of processes, and not all of them are connected to cosmic rays. However, the neutrino is only produced in those processes that produce the cosmic rays, so it's really the smoking gun for finding the sources of the cosmic rays. And since the neutrino is not charged, it would just go straight to us, and we can point back to the cosmic ray sources. Um, and to tell you how much energy those cosmic rays have, um, I have a little comparison. Actually, one cosmic ray has as much energy as a baseball hit for a home run. You might not be really impressed by this because the baseball is maybe 100 miles per hour, I don't know. Um, but the baseball actually contains a lot, a lot of particles, billions of billions of particles, while this cosmic ray is just a single particle. So all this energy is just in one single particle. So it's really, really impressive. Um, so it's very interesting to, to understand where they actually come from. So which sources in the universe can accelerate particles to these incredible high energies. If we compare this to what we can do on Earth, so you've probably heard about the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva. This is where they accelerate protons, so the same particles that we see in form of cosmic rays. And they collide them, and in the collision they produce a lot of new particles. And this is how they have found the Higgs particle. This is the best we can do at Earth. Uh, we need a little bigger accelerator to produce energies that we find in the cosmic rays. And I calculated how much bigger the accelerator has to be. And actually, the radius has to be the distance between Earth and Sun if we want to produce those really high energy cosmic rays. So they're really quite remarkable. Um, of course, we have some idea where they could come from. Uh, and one of the hot candidates are black holes. So probably some of you have seen these pictures in the movie uh, Interstellar. This is a block black hole, and around it you see this disk. It's the so-called accretion disk. This is um, a bunch of material, very hot gas, slowly spiraling in around the black hole. And this gets really, really hot, billions of degrees. So it's not a good idea at all to go anywhere close with your spacecraft. Um, and we know from distant galaxies that in some cases there's not only the accretion disk, but there's also so-called jets coming out perpendicular to the accretion disk. It's still a puzzle where the jets come from, but it's probably related to, um, to magnetic fields in the accretion disk. And th those jets have a lot of energy, and they could be responsible for accelerating particles to very high energies and to produce the cosmic rays. So if we want to detect those neutrinos that are connected to the cosmic rays, we also have to go to really high energies. So I told you about solar neutrinos and neutrinos produced in nuclear reactors. But if we compare them to the high energy neutrinos from the cosmic ray sources, it's a factor of one billion in energy. And that's the same as comparing, comparing the energy released by a light bulb in one hour to a small nuclear explosion. So they had really, really high energies. Um, and in ca case of neutrino detectors, size matters. So we need a really big detector to find those neutrinos. I showed you the small detector that was used to find the first neutrinos close to a nuclear power plant. 
and the huge detector in Japan that uh, saw the first solar neutrinos. But the detector we need now to find this cosmic neutrinos is much, much bigger. So we need something that's 1 billion liters compared to um, 15, 50 million liters. So you could try to build a huge tank uh, as a detector, but in this size, this can, it's not feasible to build a tank like this. So you need something bigger. In order to understand how we can build a bigger detector, I first have to tell you what actually happens when the neutrino interacts and how you can actually measure uh, this interaction. Um, and let's say we have a glass of water and the neutrino comes in and an interaction, one of this very rare interaction happens. Um, and in this interaction, another particle is produced. So the neutrino disappears and an electron or muon, which is just a heavier, a heavier version of the electron, this is produced, and this is a charged particle. Because the neutrino had a lot of ener energy, also the electron will have a lot of energy. It will have so much energy that it travels faster than the speed of light in the water. That might so it's probably sounds mind-blowing to you because you've probably learned nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, but that's only true for the vacuum speed of light. And in a medium, for example water, the speed of light is slower so the electron can go faster than the speed of light in water and still slower than the vacuum speed of light. And when this happens to a charged particle, it will emit so-called Cherenkov light. That's a blue flash of light um, that's emitted by this charged particle. And the same is actually true in ice. So it works in ice and in water. So if we had a huge amount of transparent medium, such as water or ice, and we would just put some light sensors in there, we could actually see those very faint blue flashes and find the traces, these very rare traces of the neutrinos. So where can we find a huge amount of ice? That's the South Pole, because the con continent of Antarctica is covered by one, a one and a half mile thick glacier. It's actually the clearest ice you can find in the world. And what you see here is the runway and the South Pole Station. So it's actually the infrastructure is not as bad as you would think. And you might be wondering uh, how you get to the South Pole. So in my case, I started back in Germany at that time. I had to fly to Bangkok, to Sydney, and finally to New Zealand. In New Zealand, I got a lot of warm clothes to be prepared for the cold temperatures at South Pole. And then in the next step, I had to leave behind the beautiful beaches of New Zealand and I flew to um, the coast of Antarctica to the McMurdo station. That's actually a pretty big station. You see a picture here. It's more than a thousand people living there in summer. And it's really ugly and dirty and I was actually very happy to move on to the next step. And the next step, you fly with this uh, military cargo plane on skis, actually. This is how it looks from the inside. It's not very comfortable. But the flight is actually very beautiful because you can see these beautiful mountains and glaciers of this mountain range that you have to cross to get to the South Pole, which is actually at the center of Antarctica, more or less. Um, at the moment, it's uh, summer at the South Pole. And the temperatures range from minus 20 to minus 50 degree Fahrenheit. And the sun is up all the time. So 24 seven, it's bright. Um, and it's the opposite in winter. The temperatures drop to minus 72 uh, Fahrenheit on average, and it's dark all the time. So if you want to build a detector at the South Pole, you can only do it during this four summer months where you have light all the time. But then you can work in shifts, and you can actually do it pretty quickly. And uh, this is where they have built the largest neutrino detector in the world. It's called Ice Cube. And well, you don't see much of the detector because it's actually in the ice. The only thing you see here is the um, ice cube laboratory. That's the building where all the data is collected. Um, and to see the detector, I show you a sketch here. So again, this is the ice cube laboratory on top. And the whole detector consists of 86 um, one and a half mile long cables. And each of the cables at the bottom is equipped with 60 photo sensors. So actually, this is a one cubic kilometer cube of ice instrumented with light sensors to trace those little blue flashes produced um, by the neutrino interactions. And for size comparison, I put a picture of Golden Gate Bridge next to it. So how do we get them into the ice? 
Uh, we need to drill holes one and a half mile deep, and we do this with a hot water drill. Um, and then those light sensors are lowered down into the hole, and you see a picture here. So the light sensors have the size of a basketball, more or less, and they are um, to protect them for the, from the really high pressure in the ice. They're in a very thick glass sphere, and there's also a bunch of electronics in there. So actually, each of them has a little computer to digi digitize the data in the ice and to send then the digital data along the cable up to the surface. And this is a picture where you see how, where the module is lowered down into the ice. Um, the drilling doesn't always go smooth. Once a guy fell into the hole, and uh, he got hurt, but he, ha he had to be flown to New Zealand to be treated, but he recovered and he's fine. Um, and another time they drilled into a so-called airdrop box, so a box full of food and equipment that the plane had dropped, and they probably haven't found, so it was buried in the ice, uh, and they found a bunch of pork chops down there. <laughs> and because they used the hot water drill, they were already boiled and they were yummy. So what actually happens when a neutrino flies into the detector and an interaction happens. So here you see the neutrino coming in. The interaction happens, now the charged particle travels to the detector and it's producing this blue Cherenkov light. And each of, each of the dots you see here is actually one of the light sensors uh, detecting some of the light produced by the, um, by the charged particle traveling through the detector. And the particle can actually travel up to ten, tens of kilometers through the ice. Um, and you see the different colors, they show different arrival times of, of the light at the sensors. So the sensors are so sensitive that they can measure the, the arrival time of the light in nanosecond precision, and that's actually important because you need the difference in arrival time to reconstruct the direction of the particle. And this is what we want, right? We want to point back to the direction of the neutrino, which is then hopefully the direction of the cosmic ray sources that we are after. So Ice, Ice Cube has actually um, found the first high energy extragalactic neutrinos, and this, they are at really high energies, so um, you see that mu there's much more light in the detector compared to what I've shown you before. And because they were the high energy ones ever, they got uh, special names, they are Ernie and Bird. Um, this is actually a huge discovery, and people were really interested, and they refined the analysis a little bit, and finally, they found the whole Sesame Street at the South Pole. So in total, they found 37 events, and really each of them has a name of a person from the Sesame Street. Um, and this is really awesome because it shows that this huge detector actually works, and it's doing what it was built for. Um, unfortunately, 37 events are not yet enough to really point back to the cosmic ray sources. Um, but the detector will keep on running for 10 more years, and um, people are already writing funding proposals for a 10 times bigger detector at the South Pole. So this is what IceCube was built for. Since the topic of tonight is nocturnal, I want to talk a little bit about dark matter, um, which might seem a different topic, but actually neutrinos and IceCube can help us to answer some questions about dark matter. So what is dark matter? It does not emit uh, or absorb light, that's why it's dark, and we only know that it's there because of its gravity. So what does that actually mean? Why do we know it's there? So if we look at um, nearby galaxies, we can look at all the many stars in the galaxy, and we can uh, measure the velocity of the stars. So like the planets around the Earth, they circle around it, uh, and they, they don't fly away because they're pulled by the gravity of the, of the sun, so they, they don't leave the solar system. And the same is true for the stars that circle around in, in a galaxy. They're pulled by, by all the gravity from all the stars in the galaxy, and they don't fly away. If they had a much higher velocity, they can eventually fly, fly away. For example, if you, if you have a rocket on Earth and you want to send it to Mars, um, it needs a certain velocity to be able to leave the gravitational pull of the Earth. If it's not fast enough, it would just come back or it would circle around the Earth. But if it has enough velocity, it can actually go all the way to Mars. And the same is true for those stars. If they have too much velocity, they can leave the gravitational pull and they would fly away. So um, astronomers have looked at many, many galaxies and they can uh, measure the mass of the galaxy by looking at all the light that they see. And they can calculate how much 
how much visible mass is there. And then they looked at the velocities of the stars and they found out that the stars that are far away, they are too fast. So they should actually fly away, but they don't fly away. And the explanation for, for this is that there is much more matter in the galaxy than the visible light, than the visible matter. So there is some dark matter that's responsible for holding those stars and um, making them not fly away, actually. And the same effect was also found in galaxy clusters, which is just a, a large group of galaxies that are also gravitationally bound together. So today we know that actually only 18% of the matter in the universe is visible. And 82 is actually dark matter. So what, what is this dark matter? Initially, people thought maybe it's something not very exotic, maybe it's just hidden, heavy, normal objects. And this could be, for example, um, a star that was not heavy enough to, um, or that, that used all the, all the fuel for the fusion, and then it stops the fusion, and it just gets cold. And at some point, it will be very dim. And there might be many of them, and we just don't see them because they're so dim. Um, and they also have a name. They're called Massive Compact Halo Objects, uh, machos. But like in real life, machos don't last very long. Um, <laughs> and more sensitive instruments, such as the Hubble Space Telescope, actually observed a bunch of those objects. And they found out that there is some of them, but there's by far not enough to explain all the dark matter that we see in the galaxies. Another explanation co could be that Newton's law is wrong. So Newton calculated how the planets move around the sun, and maybe this just doesn't work on large scale for galaxies, for example. Um, there's actually really people working on this theory, but it doesn't work to, um, to explain all of the observational evidence for dark matter. So everyone's favorite uh, model right now is that Dark matter is actually a subatomic particle um, that has some mass, and it's all over the universe. But it would clump at positions where we have a lot of visible mass, for example, in centers of galaxies. Um, and maybe this could be the neutrino, because the neutrino is basically invisible, but it has a small mass. Um, people believed this for a while, but uh, finally they found out that the mass of the neutrino is not enough. So the neutrino contribute to dark matter, but only 1%. And the rest could be something like the neutrino, but much, much, much heavier than the neutrino. And those are called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. And this is actually everyone's favorite uh, explanation at the moment. So how can now um, neutrinos and ice cube help us to learn something about this WIMP theory? So in order to see the WIMP, we have to wait until it's either decaying, so it means the WIMP particle disappears and a bunch of other particles appear, and some of them could actually be neutrinos, or the WIMP particle annihilates, that means it's meeting one of its antiparticles, and then they annihilate to form a lot of energy, and this energy can produce new particles, and they decay, and some of them could be neutrinos again. So if we find in the sky um, a lot of neutrinos from one direction that could tell us that um, there's a lot of dark matter decaying or annihilating. And where would we look to find neutrinos from dark matter decay or annihilation? As I said, the dark matter is expected to clump where we also have a lot of visible matter, for example, in the center of our galaxy, in the sun, or maybe in the Earth. So people have used the ice cube detector to try to find an excess of neutrinos from those directions. Unfortunately, they haven't found any. And there's also other experiments searching for, for those WIMPs. Um, for example, there's the Fermi Space Telescope. Uh, you might have seen it in a James Bond movie as a Russian spy satellite, but it's actually just a, a satellite looking for gamma rays, the highest energy form of light. They're looking for, for dark matter decay and annihilation. There's also the Large Hadron Collider. Um, I already talked about it at CERN. They're colliding particles and produce new particles. Some of those could be the dark matter particles. And then there's experiments. They are usually located deep under the Earth in, in mines, um, where they look for a recoil of the dark matter particle from one of the atoms in their experiments. So far, none of them was successful to, to find any evidence for the WIMP. That doesn't mean yet that the WIMP theory uh, is dead. 
it only means that maybe our detectors are not sensitive enough um, and people keep on looking for them. They build larger, new, more sensitive experiments and hopefully eventually they will find some evidence for a decaying or annihilating WIMP. Um, in my opinion, IceCube is the coolest of all the experiments that can look for, for dark matter and I got my trip to the South Pole in the end. <laughs>